Uh, this is uh, KC9VKV, Jim. Uh, we're uh, located uh, up around Louisville, Kentucky. Roger. Okay, is that uh, KC9 David Kilo Victor over? Uh, Kilo Charlie 9 Victor Kilo Victor, Roger. Okay, Victor, Kilo Victor. Okay, very good afternoon, Jim. Uh, the name here is Winston, just like in Winston Churchill. And uh, I'm located in Carrollton, Georgia, about uh, 40 miles west of Atlanta, and you're putting a good uh, uh, about 10 over signal here into Georgia. Over. Roger, Roger, Winston. Well, you sounded mighty good down here yourself. Uh, well, the uh, one of the best stations I've heard this afternoon, Roger. Roger, on that, uh, we're running about uh, 500 watts out here. Uh, the rig is an old Kentec Triton 4 Digital, uh, running into an Ameritron AL811, putting about 500 watts into a dipole antenna up about 25 feet. Uh, oh, Roger that. Uh, it's mighty good signal. Uh, we're running a, uh, an older uh, Yezu 990 uh, feeding uh, uh, Heathkit uh, SB220 and then we uh, go to uh, a uh, inverted V uh, off, the, um, off the mast at probably about 35 foot. Roger. Okay, yeah, you're sounding really good here. Um, how's the weather up there now in Louisville? Are you, uh, do you still have snowfall on the ground, or is it uh, clearing up? Oh, uh, it's been clear for uh, quite a few days. Uh, never was very much to speak of, you know. Uh, we did catch uh, a couple of days of rain, but uh, nothing, uh, you know, drastic there either. And uh, right now it looks like it's supposed to rain. I think it was supposed to rain, but uh, you know in the Ohio Valley it always looks like it's about to rain, Roger. Yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, we're having a nice day here in Georgia. Uh, it was very cold yesterday in the 40s all day, but today it's getting up to about the mid-60s, and I think tomorrow uh, we're supposed to have temperatures uh, maybe as high as 78 degrees. It sounds like summer. Of Roger, Roger. Well, you're, uh, you know, in an area that uh, always has uh, beautiful weather. You know, you're just uh, one click away from Florida, you know. Yeah, it's not that far, not that far, really. Uh, I'm located, uh, of course, a little bit more towards the northern side of Georgia. We're about, uh, I'd say, about 45 miles west of Atlanta and about 15 miles from the Alabama border in uh I think Chattanooga is about 75, 80 miles uh, to the north here. Over. Roger, Roger. Do you have uh, much of a ham radio group uh, in your area? Uh, yeah, there's a pretty active ham radio group. I am not in our local club, but uh, there is a pretty active local club here. And uh, I know recently looking over the uh, QRZ uh, list, uh, I'd say there's about 50 or 60 uh, hams here, maybe, over. Oh, Roger, that's pretty good. Uh, I guess you got uh, uh, UHF and VHF repeaters galore down that way? Yeah, we have um, a 2-meter repeater and a, a 400 uh, megahertz repeater, and uh, I don't get on those a lot. I know there's a local net that meets on them uh, weekly, an emergency net. Uh, my only two-meter gear right now is a little bad thing, uh, handy talkie that uh, I use mostly. Turn it on when it, the weather's getting bad and looks like we might have a tornado or something over. Oh, Roger, Roger. Well, do you, uh, I uh, have uh, three of those Bofangs, and uh, I couldn't uh, live without them, Roger, Roger. Yeah, it's quite a deal. Uh, I hadn't even heard of them until uh, my brother gave me a gift certificate to Amazon uh, a couple years ago, and I just uh, 
got online, looked to see what I could get for the money, and I noticed uh, they were selling those things for about thirty dollars. And I thought, heck, I can't lose for that. Even if it goes bad in a day or two, I mean, or a year or so, it's worth the money. You know? Oh, that's a Roger. That's a Roger. And it's just amazing how well they're they're made. Uh, that radio, you know, probably should sell for 300, 400 bucks, I think. I mean, you know, it's it's always uh, just uh, operates perfectly, never a malfunction, uh, always uh, on frequency, you know. And, and the fact that you've got uh, a dual uh, UHF, VHF radio is just, uh, just amazing, you know. A, a guy could uh, to get into ham radio for, for 30 bucks. Yeah, what I like about it is that you can put the uh, frequencies in on the computer. Uh, uh, I set it up with one of those software programs, and you just go in, and uh, it's got a table, and you just type in the uh, repeater frequencies and uh, offsets and stuff, and it puts them right in. Uh, I like it a lot better. I had, uh, I still have an old Alenco, and... I finally gave up on it. I couldn't. There was so much key punching and stuff you had to do to put new stations in, and uh, all I have to do with that bell thing is go online there and type in the new ones and reload it, and it's uh, ready to go. Over. Absolutely. Uh, I, although the bow thing, if you try to do it manually, is a, is a son of a gun. <laughs> it is. Uh, I mean, you know, there are some radio manufacturers that just. Uh, They've got a knack for, um, you know, setting up how to program them, like Yezu on their uh, two meter and uh, uh, 70 centimeter radios. Uh, there's nothing easier to program than uh, a Yezu, you know. And by the other token, I've got a, a Kenwood that I, I call that the uh, radio from hell, Roger. Yeah, I know what you mean, that... Uh a Linco, uh that I have, I never could figure it. Just too many steps to uh, put the stations in. I also had a ICOM uh, uh, mobile uh, two meter that I sold a while back. Never did use it because it was so uh, complicated, so much stuff to do to put the stations in. Uh, um, I just didn't care about trying to learn to do it. So. Roger, Roger. Well, thank gosh for for uh, small favors. I ran across this guy out at the uh, uh, my Seventh uh, Street uh, flea market that uh, is a Bofang expert. You know, so uh, <laughs> when in doubt, I take my Bofangs to him, and he's got my he's got my uh, you know just like you have your computer stuff. He's got my computer stuff, and he'll uh, spend about fifteen minutes and load load three of them, and I'm uh, sitting there looking in amazement, Roger. Yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, that That's much easier for me to do, and uh, I bought one of the ARRL uh, repeater directories, and if I'm going to be in a new area where I want to uh, load the repeaters in, I just look them up in that book and uh, sit down there at the keyboard, add, add them to my chart, uh, and... Uh, reload and and they're in in the handy talkie yo. Roger and I think that Bofang has got uh, 200 channel memory you know so uh, it's just uh, just really uh, just really amazing and usually um, like uh, I uh, have a little pedestal on my bicycle and uh, I've got uh, you know a Bofang that I can uh, uh, Velcro, uh, uh, you know, it's got a hook, uh, well, a loop around it, and uh, I just clip the uh, Bofang to the uh, uh, to that uh, loop, and uh, away we go. I got this uh, real special antenna. It uh, at the top, it's like seven and a half feet off the ground, but uh, you know, it, it's uh, uh, well, let's see here, gorilla taped <laughs> and tie wrapped uh, to the uh, to the pedestal. And uh, it's got uh, three load coils. And um, before, I, I've got a little ped, uh, pedway that I ride around the, this lake in the park. And uh, before, I could hit about uh, 10 repeaters uh, from the pedway. And now with this uh, special antenna, I can hit uh, 18 repeaters from the pedway. It's just uh, amazing. And the furthest one is uh, a UHF that's 56 miles away, Roger. Yeah, that's doing pretty good. 
have to say that. I also recently looking and noticing there's uh, several Chinese uh, HF rigs that are available. I think most of them are uh, QRP. Uh, they run around 20 watts, but uh, I think most of uh, the amplifiers, like this Meritron, you could uh, put uh, that 20 watts in and uh, come out probably with a couple hundred to 300 watts or so on it. So they look like a pretty promising uh, rig, uh, the little Chinese ones, for somebody who uh, doesn't have a lot of money to get started. Though. Oh, Roger that. Yeah, I have uh, played around with some Motorola stuff. Uh, I've got uh, some Max Tracks, which are smaller uh, two meter radios and uh, then some larger truck mounted ones uh, that uh, the Meritrax and the interesting part about the Meritrax is that the exciter puts out uh, four watts so I just did some experiments and I hooked my uh, Bofang up to the uh, Meritrax uh, input took the exciter out and plugged my uh, uh, Bofang in there and uh, I was uh, on steroids on that Bofang I was doing a doing 120 watts, Roger. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. I noticed uh, Bullfang, they offer a, uh, they offer an amplifier, uh, amplifier that will amplify those radios too. I can't remember, I think maybe it's like 50 watts or so. Uh. Roger, well, I often wondered why they didn't do that, so I'm glad they uh, they followed my uh, suggestions. <laughs> Although I never I never told them, but uh, that would be just a, I thought a natural, you know, to put a a uh, uh, an amp uh, for that uh, little Bofang to kick it up to about uh, 50 or 60 watts, you know, uh, uh, really make it uh, uh, a really neat uh, radio with that kind of power. Yeah, is there much two-meter activity uh, around your area? I, I've noticed around here, I listen in some, turn on uh, uh, my HT and let it scan some and stuff, and I don't really hear near as much traffic as I used to back in, like, the 80s and 90s. So. Well, you're probably right there. I mean, I, I've got 18 repeaters. Don't mean there's anybody there. <laughs> but uh, I mean, I'm I'm tooling around the pedway, so uh, uh, I might as well make use of <laughs> you know the attempt to communicate. I do c pretty well. That we have a couple of uh, repeaters that are, are really active, and uh, I usually wind up on those. But I do go through the. Uh, the regiment of uh, you know uh, uh, giving shouts out to these other repeaters, but uh, you're you're right. I, I seldom have uh, any much response uh, from a lot of them. Yeah, I know. Back in uh, back before uh, cell phones became uh, uh, popular, uh, I used to carry. I always carry my HT around my car with me and. Uh, most of the uh, repeaters, I guess they still do, but back then people made use of the uh, uh, dial, uh, the dialing thing. I forget what it's called, but you can make telephone calls through a repeater. And I used to occasionally use that if I needed to get hold of somebody and I was out in my car. Uh, roger, roger. That's, yeah, uh, keyboard, tone, tone board. Uh, uh, Yezu does that quite often on the back of their... They're microphones. Um, not that uh, I use that for that anymore, but uh, there are some, sometimes, uh, like, well, in programming, uh, you can use that microphone to, to do that. Uh, I uh, have uh, a what's called a house microphone in my system, which is uh, uh, the uh, setup is a condenser microphone into an art preamp into a third octave equalizer and then up to the uh, tabletop and I've got a six position rotary switch that selects uh, which radio I'm going to work on and then a, a toggle on toggle off uh, transmit switch but uh, it's uh, just uh, interesting as far as uh, you know the, the radios various radios take various inputs and uh, so you have to match the uh, levels because, uh, you know, I'm coming out of this uh, high level, and so I've got to pad it down to a mic level to go into those uh, radios, Roger. Yeah, Roger. 
I remember the first uh, two meter radio I got, I think it was uh, uh, it was a Swan or Drake or something, it was the crystal control, and I built, uh, I built one of those pads, uh, I remember one, some company uh, had the little kits and you put them together, and I built one of those, and that was the first one uh, I ever had, and uh, of course, had to buy crystal pairs for the different uh, local repeaters you had, but uh, that was, uh, it, like I say, back then it seemed like it uh, it was really popular. Everybody was doing it. Uh, I think the technician class license they got real popular, and a lot of uh, a lot of uh, CBers were uh, switching over to ham radio and. Uh, getting in the technician class and the repeaters. So. Roger, Roger. I remember what I was going to say now about the, the uh, touch pads. Uh, you know, you can change frequencies with these uh, uh, Yezus uh, and scan uh, all by the uh, the hand microphone that comes with it, but uh, since I'm running it on a house system, I don't have uh, that uh, tone board on my microphone to do that, so I have to use that uh, actual uh, rotary switch on the radio to uh, go up and down channel, you know, and uh, so I'm running a, on two meters a, a Yezu 2900, which is a really great radio, I think. But uh, since I've been doing the manual channel up, channel down on the rotary knob, I'm now passing the uh, two millionth mile mark on my uh, rotary dial, and it's becoming flaky. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the, that is the advantage of use, doing it on the microphone, where you can just uh, channel up and channel down by by hitting a button, Roger. Yeah, I know what you mean. I have a, I have an ICOM HF rig IC718. It has those up and down buttons on the microphone, and comes in handy sometimes if you want to just uh, jump up and down frequency a little bit and not have to uh, lean over and uh, manually uh, work the radio controls. Uh, Sounds like you may have been in ham radio a while. Uh, uh, how long have you been a ham? Uh, I've been uh, hamming since I was 16 years old back in 1960. So uh, how many years have you been at Jim Jim Moe? Well, I've been uh, playing radio all my life since six years old, but uh, only a ham. I always wanted to be a ham, but uh, just never could find the time. And uh, so then uh, I, I've been now six years uh uh, amateur radio, but like I say, I've I, uh, spent uh, 50 years in commercial broadcasting, Roger. Okay, yeah, you uh, had some good experience there. Uh, I got into it as a novice. Uh, I was fortunate enough, I grew up in a little town up in Virginia, uh, just northwest of Bristol, uh, a little town called Appalachia, right near the Kentucky border, and uh, we had a couple hams in town, and one of them had been a World War II uh, Navy uh, radio operator, and he was uh, he helped me uh, get started in it and helped me build my first novice rig, and uh, it was just really exciting uh, uh, to me back then. Uh, uh, he had all these uh, relay racks of equipment, you know, the OA, uh AM stuff, and... Uh, I just thought that was fascinating. You watch all those lights flash and the needles jump and everything. It uh, uh, it really got me interested. Over. Roger, Roger. Now that first uh, radio that you built was that the uh, transmitter, or and you had a receiver, or did you build both? I built just the transmitter. Um, I bought an old used uh, Heathkit AR3 receiver, and I built the transmitter, and it was. Uh, circuits right out of the handbook, a uh, 6 AG7 crystal oscillator feeding a 1625 uh, output tube, which you uh, remember the 1625 was used in a lot of that World War II equipment, and it was the 12-volt equivalent of the 807, and they were selling back then for about 25 cents a piece on the surplus market, so that's... Uh, how I ended up uh, choosing that tube, and 
a lot of my parts came from uh, my, like my transformers were from old TV sets and uh, various parts, but I put it all together. I guess for about uh, twenty-five or thirty dollars. So. Oh, Roger that. Yeah, that's that's a great experience there. And uh, you, what you were doing about uh, forty or fifty watts? Yeah, I think it was. I was probably putting out about uh, thirty watts. Uh, it's running about. Uh, I think the sixteen twenty-five tube uh, uh, ran at about a hundred mils input at about five hundred volts. So. Uh, with efficiency, now I was probably getting about 30 watts or so, but I think that's the most fun I ever had in ham radio because I started working stations and I would uh, look them up on a map, put a pin in the map where they were, and swap QSL cards, and uh, it, it was uh, really fascinating. You know? Oh, Roger that. I guess probably the hardest thing was to f uh, figure out a means to uh, tune it. Did you did you have a, a watt meter to use, or did you have a light or something? I had two meters. I bought a couple of those sure right meters. I, I think those things you used to buy them uh, for about three or four dollars a piece. Uh, most of my parts I bought from the uh, Burstein Appleby catalog, and I had one meter that was in the grid current and one meter in the plate current. And what I would do is uh, tune up the oscillator for the maximum power that made the uh, the grid meter rise. And then I'd tune the plate for a dip and then uh, do the load control and, and do that till it loaded up at around uh, 100 mils. Oh. Oh, Roger that, Roger that. Yeah, today with watt meters, man, you just, uh, m in my case, I just uh, go for max out, you know. <laughs> I, I don't have all that much drive, so I can just uh, go f uh, for max out on the SB220, you know, and it, we're, running, we're cruising about a kilowatt, Roger. Yeah, I tune this Ameritron uh, with the watt meter now. Um, uh, just... Uh, I really set it for what the manual calls for, and you, and you don't really have to tune it up too much from that. And uh, uh, I've got a MFJ watt meter sitting on top of my radio, and I just uh, tune the plate to it hits uh, the maximum output, and uh, I figure that's uh, that's pretty close. Oh, so. uh, Roger that, Roger that. And you say you're running an, an inverted V. Just a regular dipole. It's almost more like a V than it is an inverted V. The uh, I have a one-to-one -one ballon in the center, and it's sort of sagging a little bit, so my ends are going up a little bit higher than the center. And uh, like I say, it's no more than 20, 25 feet off the ground, but uh, seems to be doing seems to be doing a good job. Oh, Winston, I want to tell you, it's a beautiful signal. And uh, we have a, a YouTube page where we uh, have our QSO Vlog segment, and uh, we do uh, air checks. Uh, we uh, try to get the best quality we can. A lot of folks that do uh, uh, QSOs, uh, record QSOs, just use a microphone in the room, so the QSO turns out sounding more like their room than actuality, so uh, we take all of our stuff direct, and uh, we have been running uh, QSO Vlog on our, our QSO uh, right now, and uh, we probably would be posting this in the next uh, two or three days. If you happen to go to uh, YouTube and do a call letter search for Kilo Charlie 9 Victor Kilo Victor, uh, that'll take you to the QSO Vlog page, and right at the top of the page, there's one that has about 140 uh, or so QSOs on it, and if you click on that one, uh, it'll open up, and uh, uh, we should uh, have uh, our QSO uh, right there towards the top, uh, just under Art Bell. Roger. Okay, I'll check that out. Uh, sounds good. Uh, your signal is really coming out. It's really strong here. You're pegging my meter uh, uh, about 30 over, so uh, about as far as my meter goes now. So. Uh, your signal's even coming up. Uh, uh, your armchair copy, just like, uh, it's just like you were uh, sitting here in the room with me. Oh. 
Roger, and likewise, sir. Likewise, a really, really good signal. So, uh, well, we got uh, still good conditions at Winston. I'll say three is down that way. I really have enjoyed it. And like I say, if you get a chance, uh, uh, if you happen by Q2, uh, YouTube, uh, do the uh, call letter search. Kilo Charlie 9, Victor Kilo Victor, and uh, we should be right there at the top of the page. So, uh, three's Winston, and uh, you have a, a good evening, Roger. Okay, 73 there, Jim, and uh, maybe we'll catch you again on here enjoying it today, and it's really nice uh, when the band's cooperating and uh, the signals are good like this. So, back to 73 to you, this is K4CWQ, 73. Roger, Roger, Winston, three's KC9, VKV, clear.